So, you're worried about getting the vaccine. <laughs> Believe me, I get it. I'm no stranger to getting injected with things myself. Hello everyone, is it Michaela here and I am a bioengineer. I got my master's degree in chemical and biomolecular engineering. I've done computer models for drug design simulations. I know how vaccines work. I've, I've worked very closely with them. And I'm here to try to talk to you all about some of your most common vaccine questions. Because as scientists, I think it's our responsibility to communicate science to the public in a way that is accessible, understandable, and not confrontational. Uh, I don't want to try to patronize anyone in this video. Uh, I don't want to just say that all people who don't like vaccines are stupid because we're actually seeing a lot of this sentiment from across the board, from people who have good educations, that went to college, that are young. There's a lot of, I think, reasons for it. Um, but I just want to come as a scientist and talk about some of your most common questions. And hopefully by the end, you will have, know what the vaccine is, know how the mRNA vaccine is different from a standard vaccine, know how safe it is, and have a better understanding of what you're putting into your body. So enough of the intro garbage, let's do this. Okay, so first things first, I wanna talk a little bit about what a vaccine is and why the mRNA vaccine is different and groundbreaking as opposed to the standard conventional vaccine. And I'm gonna to try to go through this as quick as I can and we're gonna use some visual aids uh, via the theater. So um, cut to the theater. The vaccine is just an inactivated version of the virus that enters your body. Your body's like, Hey, dude, I've never seen you before. What are you doing? And because the virus isn't activated, it can't multiply, it can't attack anything. It kind of just sits there. And then so your body's like, well, I guess it's time for you to go and it needs to kick you out. But it can't actually kick out the germ until it neutralizes it. And it neutralizes it with a molecule called antibodies. They're these tiny little biological weapons that stick to the outside of the germ and keep it from multiplying or interacting with your body and binding to things and causing trouble. Your immune system has to go through this process of trying to shoot a bunch of different antibodies at this germ, hoping something sticks. It tries stuff of different shapes, different sizes, different orientations, hoping to find something that binds to the outer shell of that germ. If it finds something that binds to the outer shell of that germ, great. The immune system's like, hey, log that away in case we get this type of visitor again, and they do. And then the immune system is like, okay, cool, here are the instructions to make more of this antibody. And so the immune system's like, great, we'll make more of that if we need to. And then the killer T cells kill the vaccine, and then everyone has a good time. Complete. Now, if a live version of the germ comes back into the body, then the body's like, hey, I remember you from last time. What was that antibody that was really good against that? So then the cells are like, oh, hey, I've got an antibody for this. And so they print out instructions to send to the cells to make more of that antibody. And they make more of that antibody, they kill the cells, and then you're all good, and then you don't die, and everything is great. Complete. Now, how is the mRNA vaccine different? So remember back in the first visual aid, when I said, when the body figures out what antibody works against the germ, it makes a record of that and tells the cells to make more of it. Well, that instruction to make more of the antibody, that, that genetic instruction is called an mRNA. Think of DNA as your body's computer system and an mRNA as a printout of a set of instructions. mRNAs get delivered throughout your cells all the time when they need to make different proteins. Antibodies are no different. So what this vaccine is doing is basically cutting out the entire first step of the vaccine process. Every germ has some characteristic protein shell. In the coronavirus's case, they have what's called the spike protein. That's that characteristic little spiky thing on the outside of the COVID molecule. And when the body makes antibodies for COVID, their antibodies are targeting that specific spike protein. What the mRNA vaccine is doing is saying, hey, rather than actually injecting the body with a germ, it's injecting the body with instructions. Those instructions tell the body, hey, we need to create this spike protein. The body creates the spike protein, and then the immune system goes, 
hey, this spike protein doesn't belong here, let's make antibodies to neutralize it. So then the body creates the antibodies for the spike protein, and then if a real version of this comes along, it will have the spike protein, the body will be like, hey, I remember that. It wasn't attached to you, but I still remember that that scarf. So then the body's like, hey, what did we have to fight scarves? And the body was like, oh, hey, here's this mop. And the body's like, hey, thanks. And then so they attack the scarf with the mop and neutralize the virus, and then everyone goes home happy. So there is no virus getting injected into your body at all. It's literally just sending instructions, which is way more elegant, way simpler. And according to the current data by the FDA, very, very effective in generating the right immune response. Okay, you now know what a vaccine is. Question now becomes more questions. The first question, is it dangerous because it was rushed? No, at least not as far as we know, but we know a lot. Vaccines have a timeline that spans years and having to do all of this in one year and just shoot out a vaccine I can understand if you're not familiar with how vaccines work or you don't really have a big stake in the biotech industry, why that would be super, super concerning. So let's talk about that. There were a few factors that contributed to the FDA's very, very rapid approval of a vaccine. The first is that the coronavirus or COVID-19 is within the SARS family of viruses. The SARS family of germs has been studied for over 50 years. So because of this additional study in the coronavirus family, they knew all of the best places to target when trying to design the antibodies that would neutralize the COVID for this vaccine. They had a ton of research already in the works in the past five decades for this class of viruses. There was already a lot to draw from. Vaccine developers collaborated across the globe at lightning speed. They actually successfully sequenced the COVID-19 genome 10 days after its first reported case in Wuhan. So we already knew the genome. We already had some uh, candidates for neutralization via the characteristic spike protein. All that was left was to work with other labs uh, to create this vaccine. The mRNA technology was also in the works long before it was actually applied to the COVID-19 variant. So the spike protein information that we got from our genetic engineering was plugged into a previously working platform that we had used to fight dengue. And voila, you have a first working trial of the COVID vaccine. So the rest of the approval process came from testing it on active patients, of which there was no shortage. As you can imagine, this past year, there was a, a very large group of people that are at risk, and there were a lot of patients that were willing to go through these trial phases uh, to test the vaccine. These phases were actually able to be done in overlap. And the reason that it was emergency use was to grant the FDA the ability to go through these approval processes much quicker than normal. So to combat these misgivings with the vaccine, they tried to be as transparent as they can. And you can actually access the entire vaccine safety and efficacy report online for free just by going to this link. I'll link it in the description below. But the vaccine report in its executive summary says, and I quote, safety data from approximately 38,000 participants greater than 16 years of age, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to vaccine or placebo with a median of two months follow-up after the second dose should just a favorable safety profile. The frequency of these serious adverse events were low, less than 0.5%, and the vaccine had a 95% efficacy in preventing COVID after the second dose. So just by looking at the Pfizer document, uh, we see that it has a 95% efficacy rating in protecting yourself against COVID with severe adverse reactions less than 0.5% of the time. And those reactions were mainly delegated to anaphylaxis from typical vaccine allergies, which we already knew about. That's why doctors ask you if you're allergic to any medicines, because that's one of the adverse reactions for vaccines. The follow-up period for at least the Pfizer's FDA was two months. So we have data up to two months before that was approved for emergency use. And we don't have anything past that. However, this is where something called the mechanism of action comes into play. When you're trying to assess risk and you're trying to understand what is dangerous and what is not, it's helpful to understand a drug's mechanism of action. What is it actually doing in your body? How reactive is it? What chemical components are in there? Most of the time, vaccines have a very standard 
benign set of components in them. These components are well studied and they are not known to have any sort of long-term effects on their own. Their chemical reactivity is very low, aside from the actual part of the vaccine that gives you the immunogenicity. And so when people are worried about questions like, will it affect my reproductive health? Will it give me these weird side effects 10 years down the line? Will I be okay in 20 years? You have to think, what part of the vaccine would do that? It can't be the active part of the vaccine, because all that's doing is telling the body to make antibodies for a germ, which your body does literally every day. So unless your immune system working hurts your reproductive system, that's not really something to worry about. But it's useful to know what else is in vaccines, because it's not just the mRNA, right? It's other things too. So let's, let's look into that. Here we go, the center of disease control. What is in a vaccine? I'm gonna go down the list and let y'all know exactly what's in this vaccine uh, and where else you get these things from. Now, first ingredient is preservatives. Uh, this is to prevent contamination. And an example of this would be thimerosal, which is only in multi-dose vials of the flu vaccine, uh, but you can get thimerosal from eating certain kinds of fish. So uh, if you eat fish, you already have this in your body anyway. Another ingredient is adjuvants, which is an aluminum salt to help boost the body's response to the vaccine. Uh, you can find these in drinking water, infant formula, or antacids, aspirin, and antiperspirants. Stabilizers, to keep the vaccine effective after it's been manufactured. Sugars, gelatin, you can find this from eating jello. Uh, residual cell culture materials, uh, like egg protein to grow the virus or bacteria, you can get this from eggs. Uh, residual inactivating ingredients like formaldehyde to kill viruses and deactivate toxins. Turns out there's actually formaldehyde in your body naturally. Uh, more than what the vaccines have. And then just some residual antibiotics to prevent bacteria. Um, I mean, we use antibiotics all the time, so you don't need to worry. These are all the ingredients that the CDC lists in the vaccine, none of which are particularly foreign uh, or reactive. We have all of those in one form or another in our bodies from the foods that we eat and just from our body's natural makeup. So when you're trying to think about, is the vaccine dangerous, you have to think, okay, are any of the ingredients that is in it known to be dangerous in the amounts that you're being injected with? And if that's not true, then there's really no reason to assume that it would hurt your reproductive health or hurt your health four years down the line or really anything disadvantageous over a very long period of time. So let's talk about some of the fringe cases uh, and talk about reports where people have had serious reactions from the vaccine. There's a lot of hearsay online, there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of false news being sort of perpetrated around, um, but let's actually try to take a look at the facts and understand what we're dealing with in terms of really severe COVID reactions. So the only source I could find for deaths uh, is 196 following the COVID-19 vaccination, but these reports are death from any cause, uh, not confirmed to be from the vaccination. From what I can find, there is no data to suggest that there are any consistent deaths associated with the COVID vaccine. However, that does bring us to the other elephant in the room, which is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine blood clot. So let's talk about that super quick. There were some headlines going around that around 15 folks, uh, mostly women, had a deep vein thrombosis blood clot immediately following their vaccination with the Johnson & Johnson. As a result, the CDC and the FDA pulled that vaccine from circulation to study it further. Now, this should actually be a promising sign because pulling the vaccine means they are taking these claims seriously and they want to make sure that this is actually safe. It would actually worry me a little bit more if they didn't take any action, doing their due diligence, they're doing their homework, saying, okay, there's this weird effect, let's see if we can figure it out. Again, if we're thinking back to our mechanism of action, there's not a huge reason why an immune system response caused by the vaccine should make the blood clots unless this is a condition that the women have that would naturally increase the risk of blood clots from any immune system trigger. It could be a COVID itself, it could be the vaccine, or it could be the flu. There have been accounts before of people getting blood clots as an immune response to vaccines, but again, it's an immune response. There's a very high likelihood that if those same people contracted the real COVID, they would also get a blood clot because the immune system is doing the same thing. I do want to stress that there were 15 cases reported out of 7 million. 7 million. Do you know how big of a number that is? You are more likely to go to the ER 
for a pogo stick accident than have this problem with the vaccine. You're more likely to get struck by lightning. You're more likely to be a New York Times bestseller. The media has a real bad habit of taking these fringe cases and making it seem like it's the norm when it is just simply not. Does the vaccine interact with birth control? Again, probably not. Uh, it might change your period due to the fact that your body is under stress and is fighting off the disease. Is the vaccine safe for pregnant women? Yes. Yes, it is. In fact, a report that I got from Harvard shows that pregnant women not only get a good immune, re immune response from the COVID vaccine, but they also pass that COVID immunity to their offspring while they're pregnant. How cool is that? You vac it's a two for one deal. You vaccinate the mom, you vaccinate the kid. You get a super child now that is just like naturally immune to COVID. I love it. You'll love to see it. And one last thing on why you should have a public responsibility to get the vaccine. If someone is infected by COVID, that molecule can multiply. The molecule multiplies in a way that is too different from the original molecule. The vaccine that we have used for our citizens is not working anymore, or it might not work as well anymore. These are called variants, and we're already seeing variants pop up in Brazil and Britain. Although the COVID vaccine should protect us from slight variants, the more people get this, the more of a chance that even the people who do the work and get vaccinated might get reinfected. That includes your grandmothers, your grandfathers, your moms, your dads, you. It's really nice to try to cultivate an individualistic identity, but when diseases are concerned, we have to be a little bit collectivist here. You will be much safer than risking COVID, I promise you. Well, again, like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff if you want more science videos. Uh, and one more question. Uh, is Bill Gates trying to put a chip in me? That one's probably true.